Hello again internet, Astro with Roro here, and today we're taking a deeper dive into the Rainbow Astro RST-135E. This video is going to be purely looking at the back driving phenomenon which can happen with these harmonic drive mounts. If you'd like a more holistic view of what this mount is like, go check out my other video which will be linked somewhere down below for my initial impressions of the mount and what it can do. If you're interested in more of the technical performance and guiding capabilities of this mount, then make sure you're subscribed because I do have another more in-depth video coming out where I take this out under some clear skies and we see how well it can actually perform at long focal length and short focal length guiding and imaging. As you can see today, I have my Celestron 9 and a quarter inch Edge HD on the RST-135E. I believe this entire setup here is around 11 kilos, so not an extremely heavy setup, but definitely heavy enough to demonstrate backdriving. But you might ask, well, what is backdriving? This isn't something I've heard or had to think about before in my previous mounts, so what is different about this mount? To do that, let me swap this telescope over for a smaller and lighter one so I can better demonstrate backdriving to you. Okay, so here we have the Skywatcher Skymax 150. This is a 150mm Maxitov Cassegrain telescope and it weighs around 5 kilos. So, to demonstrate backdriving, what I'm going to do is I'm going to slew the telescope so that it's pointing nearly straight up towards the meridian and then I'm going to completely power down the mount. And because this telescope mount has no counterweight on it, there is nothing holding on the other side, you're going to see what happens when gravity takes over. Okay, so we now have this mount in a very unbalanced position where all five kilos of the telescope is over on the left side of the mount here and there is no weight on the right side to counterbalance that. Traditionally, this wouldn't matter because in most mounts you have a counterweight bar with some counterweights on the end and that keeps everything nicely balanced. However, with this mount, you do not need counterweights. So I'm gonna demonstrate what back driving is now by turning it off. Now, hopefully you can hear that sound. That is the mount moving. And as you can see, the telescope is beginning to back drive. As soon as you turn the mount back on, it instantly stops as those motors are re-engaged. So this is what back driving is. Essentially in this mount, there is no brake. So when the power is turned off, the RA axis is free to move around. And this can happen when there is too much weight on one side and it can overcome the resistance of the gears due to the force of gravity. So we're not gonna do some quick tests to see how you can minimize or stop back driving and can it actually hurt your gear? So let's find at what point a five kilogram setup like this will begin its back driving because remember, back driving will only occur when the mass of the object is offset enough so that gravity can overcome the resistance in the gears. And there is a fair amount of resistance in the gears in here. So you do need it to be reasonably offset or have a lot of weight. So as you can see here, we're at a reasonable offset here and we're gonna see if we get any back driving. No, no back driving with five kilos on this uh, angle. Try a little bit further. And I can start to hear the back driving. And what you'll notice is as it begins to back drive, more and more of the weight becomes unbalanced. And so it begins to back drive faster and faster. It reaches peak back driving speeds when it is completely horizontal to the ground and all of the weight is on one side. And then it begins to slowly decrease its back driving rate as more of that weight from the bottom becomes back over the center of the mount. Now I'm gonna to continue to let this one finish. Still going, it's almost finished. Okay, there we go. It has now completed its back driving. It has now got to the point where gravity can no longer overcome the resistance in the gears, and so it has stopped. Now in this orientation, it made no contact at all with the telescope or the mount here. Uh, there is still a good amount of space. However, if I had been in a more vertical position, then it would have made contact with the half pier. So that is something to keep in mind. Now let's see what happens when I attach the counterweight and counterweight bar to the back side of it to see if it will back drive then. Okay, so we now have the counterweight and counterweight bar attached to the bottom here. This is a three kilo counterweight and the bar itself weighs about half a kilo to a kilo. So we're looking three to four kilos of weight on the other side. So not quite the same weight as we have on the telescope here, but let's see what happens when we try and back drive it now. So once again, slight offset, no back driving. 
More of an offset. Still no back driving. Let's go completely horizontal here. This is the worst case scenario from a back driving perspective. And no, we had completely stopped the back driving by using the counterweight. Now this isn't required from a guiding perspective, but if it was to give you peace of mind, then you could use this counterweight and bar here to prevent back driving of this telescope. Now, what I'm gonna see now is, uh, as I start to move this counterweight inwards, at what point will the back driving begin? And this would actually tell me that the mount has been overbalanced. So you could find here a way to actually balance the mount if you wanted to. So begin moving it in here. It may actually not back drive at all. And no, it looks like with this small amount of weight on the side here, just having the counterweight in any position here is actually enough to stop the back driving. So that is what back driving looks like and how to prevent it with a lighter payload. But what happens if you have 10 or 15 kilos? Well, I'm now gonna swap back to my Celestron nine and a quarter inch, and we're gonna see how this mount fares with more than double the weight. Okay, so here we are back with the nine and a quarter inch with all my imaging optical train intact. And as I said earlier, this weighs about 11 kilos. So we're now gonna see how much and if it back drives with the counterweight, because we know it'll back drive without the counterweight since the five kilo one back drove. So let's see if this can prevent it this amount of weight back driving. So similarly to the Skymax 150, I'm gonna start in smaller increments and see at what point the back driving will begin. Okay, so here we're gonna start with a reasonably small offset to see if the back driving begins at this point. Nope, no back driving there. All right, let's see if this is enough. Still no back driving. Wow, it has actually begun. And as you're gonna see, the back driving this time is gonna be quite a bit faster because we have more weight hanging off that side. So I'm gonna stop the back driving there because I don't want this to actually complete in this direction. But what I am gonna do is I am gonna see when it's pointed at the meridian, if it will continue back driving the whole way and actually make contact. Okay, so we are now pointing towards the meridian and we are definitely hanging off that side. So I'm gonna now turn off the mount and let it continue its whole back drive to see if or at what point it actually self stops the back driving. Doesn't look like it's gonna make contact in this orientation. So it should continue through until it actually balances back out with this counterweight. Okay, there you go. That is how far it will back drive with this setup. So a reasonable distance. That would mean in another orientation, the camera actually would collide with the either mount or the tripod here. So let's see what happens when this collides. How much force does it impart and is it enough to do any damage to your equipment? Before we get there though, let's see if it's possible to stop the back driving with your hands if you were to hear it happen, say you had your battery run out or a fuse blew and all of a sudden power was cut, would you be able to stop it? Okay, so in this scenario, the mount is off balance, it's imaging something over here and your battery has just died. So what happens when it runs out of power and can you stop it with your hands or are you best not to even try? Let's find out. Okay, so just early on in the back driving, very easy to stop. Let's let it build up a little bit more speed this time. It's, act it's actually so little back driving that it's not moving at all. So let me give it a little bit of a, a little bit of a push here to start it up again. Okay, there we go. I'm gonna let it get up to its maximum speed when it's about halfway. Okay, it sounds like it's reached top speed and uh, let's see what happens. That's very easy. I am not putting too much pressure at all. I believe that's mostly because the counterweight actually helps. So you could definitely catch it. I wonder if I could do it with one hand here. Yeah, I could. However, while I can stop it with one hand, both axes can back drive. So what does that mean? Well, that means if you catch it, say towards the front, then this second axis will start back driving as well. Let me show you by holding the front here. 
Now we have back driving on the second axis. So really, you want to grab it nice and broad and nice and firm. Let me reset. Okay, so now we know that you can stop the back driving with your hands if you were standing nearby and started to hear the back driving occur. But what happens if you're not near? What if you're asleep while you're imaging or way off in the car or this is in a remote observatory? Then what happens? Well, now I'm going to turn the power off and allow the telescope to make contact with the tripod so that you can see the amount of force and speed with which the collision happens. Moment of truth. Here we go. Now in this instance, it looks like it's going to be the dovetail that makes contact. And there you go. It did just make contact. Now I'm going to put the point of contact in a close-up video just up here for you so that you can see at what point the telescope and the mount collided. Okay, so for me, this is probably the worst case scenario that could happen from a back driving. When you're pointing somewhere up towards, you know, reasonably high overhead, you have all of your imaging trains. So in this case, I have the 0.7x reducer. I then have the Celestron T adapter here. Then I have an off-axis guider and my camera sitting nice and vulnerable on the end. And I know in this scenario that this is going to collide with the leg because I have lined it up to do so. So let's let the back driving happen. And I'm going to take a close up at the same time so that you can see what it really looks like when these two make contact. Okay, here we go. Okay, so there you go. That is what it looks like when you have back driving and your imaging train collides with your tripod. Now that is definitely a worst case scenario and something that you should probably think about if you're gonna be leaving your telescope and mount unattended for long periods of time or if you have an unreliable power source. And now that you know about back driving and how you can get around it, you can go and mitigate it yourself if you have this mount. If you have a lighter payload, you can simply throw on the counterweight bar and that will completely stop the ability of the mount to back drive. However, if you have a much heavier telescope and setup like this one here, then you will still see the back driving. And in this case, if you're overly worried about it, what you could do is you could wrap the upper part of your tripod and your half pier in something that's nice and soft so that it absorbs that small impact when it does happen. Because as you saw, while there is back driving and while it does make contact, there isn't a huge amount of force involved in that contact. Of course, you wouldn't want to have a large amount of weight up on top and then have something really fragile hanging off the side of the back of your telescope. So that is something to keep in mind. So there you have it. That is everything that I can show you about the RST-135E and back driving. To me, I am not overly worried about this. I have never had a power failure in the field and I always make sure I go out with my battery fully charged. The power connection on the 135E is reasonably secure. However, I wouldn't have minded if the attachment was a locking attachment so that if you were slewing around and you had your power adapter up on your telescope, it didn't accidentally pull it out if the cables got a bit snagged. Speaking of cable snags, do make sure you're subscribed because in a future video, we're gonna be going over how cable snags can ruin your night and your equipment and how to solve it with some cool custom cables. There are some mounts out there, even by Rainbow Astro, including the 300 series, that have a break in the RA axis. This prevents back driving when the power is switched off. However, unfortunately, the 135 series does not include that break. And I would assume it's not in the 135 series because of the compact size, they simply couldn't fit it. Well, it's now time for me to take this bad boy outside and do some imaging with it so that I can get the next video out to you on guiding and imaging performance of the 135E with this nine and a quarter inch as well as my wide field red cat. Do make sure you're subscribed to catch that one when it comes out shortly. My name is Rowan, this is Astro with Roro and clear skies.